Desiree Kamika here. I am the Director of Community Engagement and the Housing Network at the Madison House Autism Foundation. I'm really excited to be talking to you today and to see that there is an interest in discussing advocacy. Now that sounds like a really scary word to some people or some people might think, oh well, I'm not political, especially in this type of political climate, but it is so important to know that one, you have to advocate. It doesn't stop once your son or daughter or yourself finishes your schooling and your education. It's going to be a lifelong thing. And two, that your voice really does matter, that it can influence policy and it can influence the future. Um, so you have to speak up, you have to talk about your story. And so today we're gonna just kind of discuss some of the areas and the things that you can do to be an advocate. Um, as many of you may have already read, I wrote an article that really talks about some of the big picture items um, for advocacy. One of those is housing. Um, if somebody can access their long-term support services, but they can't access housing, um, this presents a huge challenge because then they're not going to be able to uh, move into a consumer controlled setting. They might have to go to a group home that they don't want to go to or in worst case scenarios they might have to move to um, a nursing facility, stay in a hospital, go to an adult foster home that maybe they don't they don't know that person ahead of time for very long. Um, and so it's really important that when we think about the future we think about um, housing advocacy and separate services and housing. And so for the housing side um, there's a couple of different ways that people access affordable housing. One is called a housing choice voucher and that is section 8. Um, and essentially it's somebody who is able to um, access this voucher where 30% of their income um, is used towards rent and then the rest is subsidized by the government. Well this is a great thing um, if you can get a voucher, right? Because they're limited. So if you ever see anything in your community that says um, we're having a campaign to increase housing vouchers, by all means, even if that's not your choice for housing in the future, or maybe that's not what you want right now, go ahead and advocate for it. Um, it certainly can't hurt. There's a specific type of funding that has been set aside um, called Section 811 PRA, and it was set aside to help people with disabilities access affordable housing. And um, it was the last round of funding came out in 2015, and although very exciting and certainly will help meet um, the need, it only produced really about 4,500 units of affordable housing nationwide. Um, that's not very much, friends. We need more than that in each of the states alone. Another way that you can um, interact with the affordable housing advocacy is also by looking at your community development plan. Um, each of us live in a county um, or a township or a city that creates a master plan. And it talks about how they wanna see um, how they're going to be meeting the future transportation needs, uh, the future housing needs, um, the social support needs of the people who live in their community. And so you can try to find this plan um, and look at it and see if they have designated a certain population um, of people with developmental disabilities. And, and there's a lot of the time these plans will have um, a particular discussion on housing for veterans, a particular discussion on people who are chronically homeless. Um, but it's not as common to see discussion on how to meet the needs of people with disabilities, let alone developmental disabilities. And so being able to um, look at your county plan and to go to those meetings and say, hey, I represent 10% of the population in our county of people who have children with special needs or I'm an adult with a disability and we need to make sure we can meet the needs of our community. Can we, we need to write something in our plan that talks about wanting to develop accessible, affordable housing units as well. So those are some other areas of housing, um, setting aside funding, whether that's in a county plan or even with um, your state housing and finance authority. 
can can really open up possibilities. Florida has done a great job of setting aside 5% of their low income housing tax credits. Um, and that sounds like a lot of jumble, but it, it's actually millions and millions of dollars that have been set aside to develop housing for people with developmental disabilities. And this was started just a couple years ago, and this year people started moving into these brand new, beautiful apartments that are totally affordable for them and that have built-in supports um, to help them access their community. So being able to set aside funding can also really ensure that housing is developed specifically to meet the needs of people with developmental disabilities. Another thing that I wanted to talk about, and for those of you who are on the live stream, feel free to ask questions. Um, I'm happy to talk about that um, and to, to answer any questions that I can or at least direct you to where you can find answers. Um, also with the housing, ABLE accounts. This is a really unique way to be able to set aside money. It's a tax sheltered savings account. It's a type of 529 account where um, instead of people giving you birthday presents that you probably don't need, you can ask people to put money into your ABLE account. And that money can be um, saved for anything really in the future related to your disability, but that also includes housing. So families can start to save when their child is 10 years old, um, putting a small amount of money away every month or every year, um, and maybe one day being able to buy a house for their loved one. Um, this way they don't have to rely on a fluctuating housing market or affordable housing units or housing um, vouchers, but that that money is set aside for the future. Another thing that we need to talk about in advocacy is waivers. So um, long-term support services, so the services that people access to be able to live their life after they move from their family's home um, can be, can be uh, subsidized by a waiver. And so these waivers are basically the, the access to funding to hire direct support staff, to if you want to live um, in an adult foster care or a host family home situation, uh, if you want to live in your own apartment and have um, a service provider come and, and offer residential supports in your own home, um, these waivers are the primary way that people are able to access long-term support services. There's also another funding stream called Intermediate Care Facilities for the Intellectually Disabled. Um, it's a, it's a, a service stream where the services and the housing are inextricably tied, um, but that is another funding stream, although that funding stream seems to be depleting um, and states are really moving away from that funding model. So waivers are the predominant funding model moving forward. Um, if you don't believe that should be the case, that's another way to be able to advocate is to ensure that your state understands the unique uh, needs of certain people who have higher medical or higher behavioral challenges and that an ICF ID could be a great option for them and that your state should not just try to get rid of all of them but to ensure that people's needs are being supported and that they do have choices of service delivery models. But one other way is to be able to interact with your state about waivers. Um, every state has a different set of waivers. So one state might have two different waivers for people with developmental disabilities to access. Another state might have five. Um, another state might have 10. It really depends on whatever your state determines to create. So they can create almost like packages where there's certain types of supports that are built into each of the waivers. So if you're interacting with the system and you realize that the waiver your arm doesn't doesn't give you enough access to, let's say, physical therapy, or you need more hours of respite, or you wish you could um, have more direct support staff hours. These are all things that um, you can advocate for and contact your state about and say, have we looked into um, adding this and this and this to our waivers or can we develop a new waiver? Maybe what is needed in some places, um, I know there's a lot of people on the spectrum 
who don't necessarily need access to 24-7 support, but they need intermittent support. Every couple of days, someone coming in and just kind of making sure that, you know, they have their schedule, that they know how to access transportation, that they're keeping on top of their appointments. Um, maybe there needs to be a certain waiver set aside that's just for personal care and intermittent. Or maybe there's another waiver that needs to be set aside for people who have high behavioral challenges that need to maybe have more access to professionals who can help their family or their direct support providers um, manage some of these really challenging behaviors um, that, that some people on the autism spectrum face. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is that waivers that are available in your state right now are not necessarily what will always be available. You can change what services are part of the, and supports are part and built into those waivers. You can also advocate to have a different type of waiver um, introduced in your state. There's a waiver that's called a self-directed or a self-determination waiver, and it's not available in all states. And this waiver um, essentially allows the individual with a disability to hire, train, and fire their own staff. So it kind of takes away the, the support service agency from being the middle person and allows the individual to be able to direct um, all of their support staff. Now that could be really great for some people who um, are up for the challenge of wanting to uh, do the recruiting and do the hiring, um, but for others that might be overwhelming. Um, but at least it's another way that a waiver could be used. Um, I know in Washington, they, people can combine some of their self-directed waivers um, or personal care waivers is what it can also be called uh, and hire a host home provider to live in their home. So thank you, uh, Madison House Autism Foundation for reminding me. One of the other really big issues in advocacy right now um, is regarding these waivers in general. And in January of 2014, there were new regulations that were released. And um, you can see in the links below uh, a link to those regulations. And those regulations were to make sure that these home and community-based waivers were not being used in an institutional setting and that people were able to um, be supported with dignity and that they have choices and they have certain controls in their life um, and that they're able to access their greater community and they're able to uh, live a life that isn't an institutional in nature, that they can decorate their room and they have access to food at all times and they can come and go when they please and they can have visitors come and visit them. Basically anything that you or I would expect um, if we were living in, in a home, right? And so um, these, these regulations that have come out uh, were really outcome oriented, so based on the individual lives of people with disabilities. Well, these regulations were created by CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicare Services, and they have been releasing guidance. Um, because of the change in the federal regulations, now all the states have to redo their state regulations to comply with the federal regulations, but also assess all of the settings to make sure that the settings are in compliance. And that means group homes, um, that means adult foster care homes, that means um, people who are in day programs, people who um, are attending different, uh, maybe they work in a sheltered workshop, maybe they access supported employment, um, this is all the different services that are under HCBS waivers have to comply to these new rules whether they're residential or non-residential. And so I see your question now, and I'll get to that in a moment. And so um, one of the, the confusions that has arisen is based on a particular set of guidance that CMS has released. And in the HCBS regulations, it says that um, HCBS waivers cannot be used for settings that are on the grounds of a public institution, um, that are in a nursing facility or connected to a nursing facility, right? These are more institutional settings um, and cannot isolate people. Well, what does that mean? How is the state going to determine if a setting is isolating? Well, my first reaction would be they're going to go to the setting and they're going to see if people are isolated or if they have access to their community. 
um, CMS released guidance to help states understand what CMS meant by isolating, potentially, and they um, released this guidance on settings that tend to isolate, and they labeled four different types of settings at settings that tend to isolate people with disabilities, and that are farmsteads or disability-specific um, farm communities, gated communities or disability-specific um, plan communities, residential schools, um, and communities that have multiple services on one campus, um, so a campus-based setting. Maybe somebody lives at the setting and then they're able to walk to their day program. Um, those were the four different types of settings that CMS um, released in this guidance on settings that tend to isolate. At the last HCBS conference, they also included intentional communities um, as a type of setting that tends to isolate. Now, it's really important to know that, um, that intentional communities look very different in all different places and might use different support service funding streams. And um, a lot of people want to develop intentionally communities. And a lot of people already live in intentional communities and farmsteads and go to residential schools and don't feel isolated. But um, they are at risk of losing HCBS funding if the state or the federal government decides that their setting is isolating um, and it doesn't matter what the residents think it really is is up to the state to determine um, if the setting is isolating and so in that breath it's really important that you begin to tell your state um, you know what settings you think are isolating or what are the characteristics of an isolating setting because maybe they're going by what CMS guidance says, but what your experience is and what you know from being on the ground and from interacting with some of the local housing and support solutions, you might say, you know what, I really don't think that that residential school or that farmstead or that intentional community or that campus community is isolating at all. Um, I know what the CMS guidance says, but they, they meet all of the federal requirements requirements that are in the HCBS regulations. So one of the things that is going to be happening, um, and Al, HCBS waivers can be used in intentional communities. You just have to ensure that the state does not label it as isolating and that it does meet all of the HCBS requirements. And so what you can do for intentional communities or farmsteads or any of those settings that the guidance says tends to isolate is you need to be looking at um, opportunities opportunities for public comment in all the states, and in some of them this opportunity has already passed, but in all the states um, they are releasing a list of settings that they believe um, have the qualities of home and community base, but that the guidance says tends to be isolating. And so the state is going to have to collect evidence to show that those type of settings are not isolating. Um, and and send that to CMS. And so they're gonna be looking for public comment. They're gonna to need to be hearing from people on the ground that are either saying, yes, this community is isolating and is institutional and should not be receiving um, this funding, or this setting is not institutional. This is a viable home and community for many people. They are happy. And it's really important that we empower self-advocates to be able to talk about um, their home and their community in those ways so that they understand um, that some people might think that their home is isolating. That was one of the really neat things um, in the article I was able to share with you the presentation of six self-advocates who came from Florida, California, Texas, and North Carolina to the National HCBS Conference to talk about their life in intentional communities and to tell um, their state Medicaid authorities and CMS and the Department of Justice and the Administration for Community Li Living um, that no, my life in intentional community is not isolating, that this is a great a great option for me. Um, so if you haven't seen their presentation, I highly suggest you take a look at it. They did a fantastic job and they were so brave because they were in the midst of people who told them, no, we don't believe your home um, should receive funding and that we don't believe in the model of your home. Um, so they, they did a fantastic job advocating for their right to live in their intentional community. Um, so kudos to all of those self-advocates. 
All right, let's take a look, um, Alexandra, at your question. So Alexandra is talking about how she um, set up a housing solution, a shared living home for three people. So that is, um, she would have hired or recruited and hired a neurotypical to live in a home with three other people who are using waiver supports. She said that she's exhausted because she has had to um, coordinate all of that by herself and that she does the grocery shopping and make sure everything is clean um, and that she doesn't have the funding um, for her to continue to be able to to do that um, and I can't see the rest of your your quote Alexandra um, but she said that the response from her Medicaid agency um, was to make arrangements with a residential habilitation provider I'm assuming that would mean a group home in her state she's been unable to find a live-in support person I'm so sorry Alexandra but I mean those are the challenges of living um, in this in this place in this climate of not having enough funding and why we need to continue to constantly advocate <laughs> Al says we hate live we hate working through the regulations and the state We'd be dead before things change. So we have to figure out ways to work around the regulations and set up private funding mechanisms. Totally. I mean, Al, a lot of people are not interested in going through um, the state bureaucratic type of uh, uh, hoops that you have to jump through, or they can't access the funding at all, right? And so being able to use the private sector to create solutions is is absolutely necessary in some places. Um, you know, Al, I would say at this point in time, there's, there's two places that you have to talk to when advocating, right? The Medicaid authority is the person who's in charge of the waivers and the funding streams and how that's all allocated. Um, but there's also policymakers. So talking to your members of Congress about your story, telling them, Al, hey, I'm trying to create a solution here. We're in desperate need. We need more options. And the state is making this even more difficult. And Alexandra, I would say the same thing to you too, is to go back to your policymakers and all of you out there, even if you're not running into specific barriers as a housing project developer, but that um, policymakers need to understand our stories. They need to know what life is like um, when you rely on waiver supports um, or when you rely on access to affordable housing and SNAP and all of those things, um, they don't know. They don't, they don't, they only know what maybe their, their state staff tell them. Um, and so if you need to be a voice alongside your Medicaid authority and saying, listen, this might be what the Medicaid authority is telling you, but this is my experience on the ground, um, that's very powerful. Uh, so I highly encourage you to go and um, also talk about, you know, your life and the barriers that you're facing and trying to create a solution in your state. One of the other things that um, I wanted to share with you is a presentation that I created um, last October. And the presentation walks you through all of the different regulations and where to access them and where to find your state transition plan. The first half of the presentation is really to help give you access to the links and the information you need to understand these new HCBS regulations. But the second half of the presentation is also to walk you through how to put together the statistics. I give you um, example phrases to use and I show you exactly where to find um, your state statistics. So um, please look at that presentation. Um, it is on the Coalition for Community Choice website. I'm sure that Madison House will throw that in the live stream real quick. Um, but this presentation will, will give you access to the statistics that you need alongside your story to say, listen, state, we have a huge problem on our hands. And right now we're facing barriers to creating local solutions. Um, help me be able to help you meet the needs of our, of our citizens. Looking at Alexandra's comment. Mm. 
such a tough situation at Alexandra. Again, I would encourage you to reach out to your policymakers um, and tell them what your situation is. And if it can't fix your solution immediately, it can at least fix others. You know what though, let me, hold on. The other thing you can do, Alexandra, is um, by, by you creating this local solution that is unlicensed, your daughter is living in a consumer controlled setting. Um, if your state is telling you that you need to then put her in a provider controlled setting, that is, you can argue, is a more restrictive setting than what she needs. Um, I'm not sure if you have approached your disability rights organization, they might be able to provide you with some free advice or guidance, um, or at least support in making that argument. Um, but you should also look into making the argument that if you're going to force my daughter into a provider owned and controlled setting or by not supporting me in this local project, my daughter is now at risk for institutionalization, that might be enough to make them want to work with you um, to find a solution. I, I do get um, emails from people all the time that talk about how their state tells them that, I'm sorry, your son or your daughter in crisis, uh, we have nothing for you, we have no placement for you, we have no group home for you, we have no nothing for you. Um, at that moment, your son or daughter is at risk for institutionalization and they need to be reminded of that. Um, and that as a person with a developmental disability, the Developmental Disability Rights Act, the Olmstead decision, um, all support their right to access the accommodations and support needed to ensure that they don't end up um, being forcefully or involuntarily placed in an institution. So, um, for those of you who keep getting that, I would say make sure that you remind your state that uh, my son or daughter does, should not be involuntarily placed in an institution and by um, keeping them from the supports and accommodations they need to live in the community, um, you're violating their rights. Would an intentional community that includes autism, Down syndrome, and other IDD be looked at more favorably by CMS than an ICE, than an intentional community that only caters to one disability? Um, CMS has used the term disability specific um, in the past. I think that um, it's less about uh, one diagnosis per se and more about um, the fact that more people with disabilities would be living together um, than if they were in an integrated setting. Um, I would say a lot of intentional communities that are being developed because there is such a need for natural supports because people cannot access the waiver supports needed to live independently with only using paid staff, that incorporating neurotypical roommates or neurotypical neighbors um, will one, help with your natural support system, especially in times of crisis or in times of emergency, um, but also will, um, will, will increase the integration um, of neurotypicals and the neurodiverse population. And I say that because I, um, I'm treading on thin line here because I believe that people with disabilities have the right and should not be ashamed to live with other people with disabilities. Um, as a minority population, it's important that they have access to uh, the culture and the support that they need from peers or other people from in their minority. Um, so when I say uh, adding the integration of neurotypicals, I'm not doing it in a way that I think it's better because neurotypicals live there. Um, I think that my friends with Down syndrome look at me as an equal friend, as another person with Down syndrome or another person with autism. And us as neurotypicals in policy sometimes do not look at friendship um, and relationships with the neurodiverse, across the neurodiverse population the same as we do with 
as relationships with the neurotypical population. And I think that that's wrong. Um, all relationships are equal, whether you're neurotypical or you're neurodiverse. So I use that caveat in talking about intentional communities um, because I want to ensure that that people understand that when I say the integration of neurotypicals, it's more because it's unpaid support. It's people who can offer rides to the grocery store. It's people who might be able to use the internet to coordinate, you know, a Friday night at the local pub. You know, it's people who uh, who have the executive functioning skills to organize another group of people to do things that they want to do. Okay. Um, so please take a look at that presentation so that when you do talk to your policymakers, you're looking at not just sharing your story, which is super impactful, but also um, the statistics of how, of how many stories your story might represent. Another, another aspect of this is being able to help people with disabilities advocate for their own housing choices, um, for them to understand how policy will affect their lives and that their voice is powerful. Now, a lot of people may say, well, my son or daughter can't speak, um, but that doesn't mean they can't go with you to a meeting and that you can't be that voice for your son or daughter while your son or daughter is also there and to speak in a way that, you know, puts them front and center, um, their needs front and center as an independent adult. Another thing that you can do to help influence your state and the people who are talking to Medicaid authorities is join your DD Council, um, your Developmental Disability Council. This is one of those federally funded entities that's available in all, in all across the country. Every state has a DD Council and every state has a DD Council that has funding attached to it. So that means, let's say, um, there's a, a gap in supports in your state and you go to your DD council and your DD council is talking about what are we going to do with this funding for the future? Um, you can say, well, hey, why don't we pilot a program that um, helps, helps decrease abuse or helps increase the reporting of abuse or helps create natural support systems for transportation? Um, you as individuals with disabilities and families with disabilities need to be involved in your DD councils because one, they have funding to implement pilot programs and two, they are looked at as the voice for your state, for citizens with developmental disabilities. So you need to ensure that they're speaking um, in such a way that also represents your perspectives. Um, so please, I, I encourage you to look at your DD Council website, see what it is that they're doing. Um, I encourage you to join a DD Council meeting if you can. Um, most states, it's the governor that elects who is on the DD Council. It's not the case in all states, but most of the time it is the governor. If you start to attend these meetings, you might be appointed to be on the DD Council, but all of these meetings are public. You should be able to attend these meetings. And if they don't have a virtual option for attendance, I suggest you push for it. It may not be possible if you live in a large state to drive three hours to a DD Council meeting, but it, as much as it's not possible so for someone who can drive, imagine how much more impossible it is for someone who can't drive, who relies on public transportation. Um, so please make sure that you, uh, that you, you're looking at your DD Council as a way to be able to um, become more involved in advocacy. So. Just to recap, um, you want to be able to join your DD Council, you want to be able to talk to your policymakers. we've given you the presentation where you can access statistics for your state. Um, I'm willing to help if you just send me an email, you can uh, reach me and I'd be willing to help y'all. We're going to be sending a survey. We are, uh, we've started to do these live streams a little bit more often and we want to know if they're helpful um, or how we can change the live stream format to make it more helpful for people. So if you have a, uh, any feedback, please fill out the survey. Um, also, this survey will give you the opportunity to, to, to comment on what other topics do you want to talk about. 
uh, in these live streams. I'd love to be able to know what it is that y'all are interested in so that I can help prepare some information, um, write something about it, and then we can have this, this discussion together. So if there are not any other questions, uh, that concludes our live stream on housing and advocacy. Please go to the Coalition for Community Choice website. It's just coalitionforcommunitychoice.org. It is one of the programs that Madison House Autism Foundation leads. I'm the national coordinator of the Coalition for Community Choice. And you can join as an individual or as an organization and um, get more up-to-date information about when your state transition plan comes up for public comment, what are some of the policy trends that are happening, um, if states are making headway uh, with different you know, policy uh, that can help increase um, and expand housing and support options. So thank you all for joining me today. This has been great. And, and please uh, fill out the survey so that we can constantly improve this program. Um, thank you all very much. Hope you have a fantastic weekend and go out there. Be the voice of change. It really does take your voice and your voice really does matter. Don't think you have to be a professional policy person or anything. Just go tell your story and say we want more options. Um, the, future, the future needs them. So thank you so much y'all. Thank you.